So hi everyone, thank you for coming out today. Um, so welcome to our second virtual HIMSA speaker series. We're super excited to bring this series to you all. My name is Micah House and I serve as the current president of HIMSA. The Health Information Management Student Association is the undergraduate student association of HIM juniors and seniors, as well as prospective students who might be interested in learning more about our profession. So if you would like to become a member of HIMSA, please email me, we would love to have you. And please enjoy this hour and watch for future speaker series events. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please drop them in the chat and we will go over them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So I would like to turn it over to Dr. Valerie Watzloff, who is the past president of the American Health Information Management Association, and she will be introducing our wonderful guest speaker. Oh, thank you so much, Micah, and thanks to all, all of Hamza and for, for uh, and to Kim, Dr. Kim, for putting this together. Thank you. And I am so ecstatic to have Dr. Walisa Wiggs Harris join us today for our second Hamza speaker presentation, and I am very honored to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Harris, if you don't know already, is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA which is the leading voice for health information management through health data integrity and best practices. And Dr. Harris joined AHIMA as CEO in February of 2018, developing the organization's strategic plan and advancing its mission and vision nationally and internationally to position AHIMA as a global leader. Dr. Harris serves as an ex officio member of the AHIMA Board of Directors, the AHIMA Foundation Board of Directors, the Nominating Committee, the Council for Excellence in Education, or CEE, and the Commission on Certification for Health Informatics and Information Management, which is CCHEM. And prior to AHIMA, Dr. Harris was CEO at the League of Women Voters of the United States and the League of Women Voters Education Fund. Working with the board of directors there, she created and led a transformation strategy to increase the impact, relevancy, and visibility of the League of Women Voters and its 700 plus affiliates. Prior to her work there, Dr. Harris served as Chief Operating Officer of the American Nurses Association, the Executive Director of the Center for American Nurses and the Executive Director of the Maryland-based Sister to Sister Foundation, which is a national organization supporting women's health issues and heart disease education. Dr. Harris served also as Senior Vice President and Executive Director at the American Heart Association. And Dr. Harris holds a PhD in Organizational Development from Capella University, a Master of Management degree from Northwestern University, and both a Bachelor and Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Wittenberg University. She is also an American Society of Association Executive Certified Executive Director. With an interest in transformation leadership, Dr. Harris coaches and mentors leaders interested in pursuing C-suite opportunities. And Dr. Harris was nominated for the most powerful women in healthcare IT by Health Data Management, both in 2018 and 2019. And on a personal note, I have had the wonderful opportunity to serve alongside of Lisa for almost three years now on the HEMA Board of Directors serving as president last year. And it has been an absolutely amazing experience, one I will always treasure. And you are a dear friend and colleague, and I am so glad that you could join us today to discuss your leadership journey, as well as the future of the HIM professional and how AHIMA can support the career development of the HIM professional. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wylisa Wiggs-Harris. Thank you, Val, and thank you all for inviting me to uh, spend a, an hour with you. It is quite an honor and a pleasure for me to do so. So let's start off by saying that health information is human information, that what we do every single day makes a difference. And one of the key differences that we can make right now is to make sure that we are humanizing, putting a face to a patient record. There are so many people who feel invisible in our world and in our society. So we get to show up and play just a small role, but a really important role in helping to bring joy 
and visibility in a way that perhaps we haven't always thought about as a profession. So during our time today, I really want this to be a conversation. So I'm gonna to try to fly through these slides pretty quickly so that we can get to the Q&A because I think that's the beauty of my being with you is uh, being able to address some of your questions. Per your request, I will share with you about my leadership journey, a little bit about the future of AHIMA, what we're working to accomplish and about the future of the profession. So what I will say about me, we're just gonna go do all of these bullet points at once here, is I'm a highly creative individual, but not in the way that you normally think of. I'm not a musician, I'm not an artist, but I have this wonderful imagination and my brain functions like a puzzle. And I don't know how you put puzzles together, but I always like to put the edges together first. And then I figure out the inside pieces. Well, that's how my brain works, is that I'm constantly moving and shifting the puzzle pieces to figure out how to move us forward. And I came by this creative bent, honestly. I am the oldest of five children. And when we would gather at my maternal parents, uh, grandparents' home, at some point, as the oldest granddaughter and the oldest of my siblings, they would turn to me and say, take the younger kids out and entertain them until dinner is ready. And my maternal grandparents had this large pecan tree. I say pecan, some of you may say pecan. And I would craft these wonderful visionary stories of how the pecan tree was a beautiful princess. And I would keep my siblings and my younger cousins entertained for hours. And so that is the beginning of my storytelling career. And I've, over the years, worked to hone those experiences. I'm a firm believer that we are all products of our experiences. So the experiences of growing up in a military family, the experiences of often being the only individual of color in advanced placement classes, all of those things have shaped who I am as a leader. And I grew up in a highly principled Christian home, and that has shaped my uh, approach to leadership as well. Now, I will tell you that I was not one who was waving a flag out there saying, hey, look at me, I want to be a leader. In fact, I was very much a reluctant leader. Most people don't believe this about me, but I'm very reserved. I am uh, quiet, I'm introverted, and I'm actually very shy. So when I was going for my MBA, the very uh, act of doing this, of raising one's hand, was an act of courage for me. But thankful for me, I had a wonderful professor, Professor Lavingood, who could look at me and tell that I knew the answer, and he would just call me out. It's one of the reasons I have such a warm spot for educators in my heart, because it was often educators who saw the potential in me before I saw the potential in myself. My whole career, I have been in the nonprofit space and I love the diversity of nonprofits. I've worked for all different types of nonprofits. Those that are larger than AHIMA, those that are, are smaller than AHIMA, those that focus on membership, those that are more charitable in, from a, a more charitable bent. I love learning. If I was uh, independently wealthy, I would be in school all the time because I love to read and I love to learn. I am a cautious risk taker. I believe that in order to move forward, whether as an organization or as an individual, you have to be willing to take risk, that you just can't stand still, that you can't not settle for the status quo. And then I do bring a change focus to the work that I do. My goal that whenever I come to serve an organization, and I do see it as a perspective of serving, is that I always leave an organization stronger than how I found it. Now, leaving an organization stronger than how you found it often means that you're pushing that organization to lean into its potential. And that can lead to uncomfortable moments for both those that you're pushing, those you're trying to lead, and for yourself. But at the end of the day, I have demonstrated success in knowing that the organizations that I leave are stronger than how I found them. 
one of the things that are a part of my journey, and I, there are so many things that at this age I wish I had known when I was younger. And you often hear about what is the letter you would write to your 20-year-old self. Um, and part of what I would write to my 20-year-old self is to really lean into my personal brand and understand my personal brand at a younger age. Yes, I understand it now, but I really wish I had understood that personal brand story when I was younger. We often hear about the importance of an organization's brand such as Nike, but each of us also have an individual brand. And what you see reflected on this slide are my individual brand attributes, that I am purpose-driven, I am principled, I lead and I guide by my values. I think that the, my staff was shocked for day, day one when I came in and the word love came out of my mouth. I'm not maybe the CEO that people would have pictured and envisioned. I am visionary. I am constantly down the road thinking about what is next. Being authentic is highly important to me. In fact, my dissertation research was based on personal and leadership authenticity and how do we do that as African-American women. I am thoughtful. I uh, often uh, see the value in stepping back. Sometimes the noise around an issue can become so loud, but it's always good to try to cut through the noise around an issue so that you can hear what the real concerns are that people are trying to articulate. I am goal directed. I'm just like my little chihuahua when you give her food. I mean, she's going in a particular direction. And so if you explain to me that my job is to do X, Y, Z, then I'm gonna do X, Y, Z to the best of my ability. And as I shared with you earlier, I am creative and I'm also empathetic. I truly and sincerely care about people. That is at the core of who I am is that I care about people. And so I'm at a place in my life where I've come to really appreciate and understand my brand attributes. And I work hard to live these brand attributes day in and day out. Had I understood them at a younger age, are there different choices that I might have made? Perhaps. Are there different ways that I might have shown up in the workplace, perhaps. And so you have such, I, I'm just so delighted to be with those of you here who are on various stages of your journey and you have a world and a future before you. And I would just encourage you to lean in to all that, all of the opportunities that, that will be afforded to you. You know, I'm often asked the question, how did you get to that CEO seat? seat? And one of the primary ways that I got here is I said yes when other people said no. So I took lateral moves for my career when other people were more focused on how do I just keep climbing? Because sometimes taking a lateral move was what made the more sense for me personally. Uh, I would take on assignments when I didn't know how the heck I was going to get it done. But that old saying, you know, fake it till you can make it. Uh, worked well for me, that I knew that either I had the skill sets to do it, or I had people in my network who could help me figure out how to do things. And so those are some of the words of wisdom that I would share with you, but let me move on with the presentation. So I've been in this nonprofit sector my entire career. And AHIMA is a special type of nonprofit organization. We're what's known as a 50C6 nonprofit organization. And a 50C6 has two categories with it, within it. You can be more of a business league, which is what we are, or you could be a trade association. So with a business league, there are people we, we unite around a common interest. And at AHIMA, we do have this common interest that we unite around. So why be a part of an association? Like I love the nonprofit sector. I love being a part of the Heart Association, which was the C3. I love being part of the League, which was the C4. I love being part of the, the Nursing Association and the AHIMA, which is a C6. So what is it that I really love about associations? I love the diversity of experience that you have within associations. The fact that 
people come here for educational and professional development and growth. The fact that you have access to resources and events, the fact that there's a code of ethics associated with just about every single association that exists, that there is a certification that's offered here, that there's networking and job searching and peer collaboration and support and advocacy, advocacy not just on behalf of members, but from a societal um, perspective. These are all the elements of what constitutes an association. And it's why I love working in this sector so much. There's a little bit of something for everybody here in the nonprofit sector, in particular, the association component of the nonprofit sector. So when we talk about AHIMA, AHIMA, we're not the largest of associations, but we sure are one of the more complex ones. So within the AHIMA parent or the 5-6 or 501c6 organization, as Val was sharing with you on my uh, bio, we have AHIMA proper. We also have a certification arm. We have an education arm. We have an international arm. So I was chatting with some individuals earlier uh, before we began the actual broadcast, sharing with them that I had an opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of AHIMA to a conference that's taking place in Berlin. We also have a charitable arm, the AHIMA Foundation, and the AHIMA Foundation is focused on how do we best support HIM, but, but from the perspective of a public good. And then we have a federated connection to our state organizations. So in this particular season, one of the questions that I often get is, how do you stay focused? How do you stay upbeat and positive and smiling when there's just so much negativism around us with what's going on? We're, we're navigating the triple pandemic of a global health crisis, civil and racial unrest, and economic meltdown. Well, you've got to have something that you anchor on. And so uh, from a personal perspective, I anchor to my personal values and I anchor around the notion of hope. When I put on my CEO hat, these are the three things that I anchor around. Ahima's primary purpose, and I am so grateful for Ahima's founders and founding leaders because what they did for Ahima is they gave us this higher calling with this primary purpose statement. Because right now as organizations are trying to figure out how to navigate through COVID and survive, people are trying to figure out how to become solution oriented. But our founding leaders, they gave us our solution oriented component. They gave us the answer to the question of why do we exist within the larger healthcare ecosystem? And that is to ensure excellence in the management of health information for the benefit of patients and providers. That's our high calling. And then when you couple that with our new mission statement around empowering people and our vision statement of making sure that we are connecting people, systems, and ideas, that's a really powerful platform that we get to operate from. And so here again, it's just another slide showing our mission and our vision statement. I'm not gonna go through our strategic plan in detail, but there are three big buckets that we focus on here at AHIMA. One is around policy and thought leadership. It is really important for both the association and the profession that we have a strong and a vibrant voice externally. And it's important internally. But if we're gonna lean into that very bold, primary purpose statement, we have to make sure that people know who we are as an organization, who we are as a profession, and what we stand for. And one of the challenges that all nonprofits and associations face is that we're very insular. We often just look at the internal component of it. But if we're going to navigate COVID, and we are, if we're going to get from surviving to thriving, which we are, then we have got to make sure that we have strong thought leadership and that we are seen as a policy and an advocacy powerhouse. And we are well on our way to achieving that. So that's what strategic objective one is about in a nutshell. 
strategic objective two is around shaping the profession. And there's the pipeline into the profession and there are those who are working in the profession right now. And how do we ensure that people are equipped with both the technical skills to be successful and the interpersonal skills to be successful. One of the things that we are hearing across the board, not just related to, to HIM, but broader than HIM, is that hiring managers, CEOs like myself, we are looking for individuals with the critical thinking skills and the interpersonal skills to be able to navigate the complexity of the environments that we are operating in right now. And that's, a, that's what this particular middle objective around shaping the profession is about. And then the third objective is about transforming and growing as an organization. We're over 90 years old, which means we've always been willing to transform and grow. And whether you're an organization or whether you're an individual, you can't stand still. You have to constantly be stepping back. You have to constantly be reinventing yourself. And that is what that objective number three is about. So I'm gonna segue a little bit more and talk about to you as students. And, and why should you join? I mean, for those of us who are more mature, we kind of grew up in the time in which it was just automatic. Whatever profession you were in, you joined your professional association. There was no question associated to it with it. But the world's a little bit different in terms of how we look at engagement and community now for those of you who are much younger. You still value community. You still value engagement. It just looks different than it did for those of us who are more on the mature side of, side of things. And so we offer a very robust student membership there, when you join and affiliate with us, you get a welcome letter and you're going to get these slides and you're going to have all of those details because I'm not going to cover those details right now. But what I will, because I want to spend some time talking about community. One of the things that I uncovered uh, with when we went into lockdown and I could not travel for work or for personal things is that my communities were not as deep or as broad as I thought they were because my communities, because I'm still relatively new to the Chicago area, just moved, moved here, what, three years ago, I really hadn't had time to build roots here in Chicago the second time around beyond the family that we have residing here. And it was kind of isolated and it was lonely. And so I made a conscious decision to increase my communities. And for an introvert like me, it's actually been great to do all this stuff virtually. We can't exist out here by ourselves. You have to surround yourself with communities because often there, there's knowledge that's shared in a community that's not gonna be shared in any other format. Often there are job opportunities that the community is gonna know about that's not gonna be posted on a job board. That's one of the reasons I'm such a strong believer around the notion of communities. So part of what we do offer within AHIMA is we have this mentor matching program. And I would encourage you to take advantage of this mentoring matching program. Interestingly enough, yesterday I received through LinkedIn an email from someone I don't know. I have never met. She is an AHIMA member. And she said to me, I finally decided to take the plunge and just reach out and see if you would mentor me, if you would say yes. That's how it starts, by being courageous enough to reach out to a potential mentor and say, will you mentor me? Because we all need mentors. It doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter where we are in our career, whether we're a student, whether we're just starting out, whether we're starting to wind down our career. We all need someone that we connect to who will mentor us. And so th this is one of the great things that, that we do offer to our students through AHIMA. But you know what? A mentor is not enough in this day and age. So once you're in that working environment, you need a champion. You need a ch champion who's going to pull your coattail and say to you, you know what? Here's what you do amazingly well. 
And here are some things that you could do differently. And oh, by the way, here's a new opportunity you might want to look at. That champion is someone who's going to make sure that when there are meetings occurring that you're not a part of, when they're having the conversations about who's our high um, potential employees, that that champion is going to make sure your name gets put into that room. That's a value of having a champion. So you need that mentorship, but you also need that champion who's going to fight battles for you, that's going to block and tackle for you, that's going to make sure your name is in the rooms that it needs to be in. And it starts when you're a student, because when you're a student is when you start developing the skills and you start learning the um, acumen and you start developing your courage to be bold about saying, hey, would you be willing to be my mentor? Can we go to a virtual coffee and see if you'd be willing to champion me? Your practicum is also an important part of the work that we support you on. And yes, there's been some creativity that's had to be developed to learn out how to do practicums in the environments that we are operating right now. But that's a still an important part of how we support our students. Our Career Center, you can check this out on the website. Uh, one of the things I want to point out here is that when we do conference every year, we do a call for volunteers and, and think about what I said earlier. Part of how I got to be in this seat is I said yes when other people said no. When people ask you to volunteer, find a way to say yes. When people send out a survey or people being a HEMA in this case, we send out a survey and we ask for your input, find a way to say yes to always offer your opinions. And that starts now as a student and you build and you enhance those skills as you move forward. And then at the end of the day, it's all about engagement. Often we think we can do life by ourselves. We can't do life by ourselves. We need to do life within communities and we need to do life reaching out and touching other people. That is what enhances our society. That is the beauty of nonprofits and associations, which are often referred to as the third sector in our uh, country, because addressing many of the societal problems that exist within the US and broader, they, they occur, solutions occur because of engagement of members, because of engagement of volunteers in organizations such as AHIMA. So I hope you hear my passion. I hope you understand that even though I was a reluctant leader, I'm really excited about being a HEMA CEO. I'm excited about being a leader. I'm excited about being a part of an association that has such a high calling to make a difference in the life of patients and providers. Because the life, the work that we do and the life that we touch and the life that we save could be our own or our loved ones. So that's what I wanted to share with you from a PowerPoint perspective. And as I said, I wanted to go through that relatively quickly because I believe that the beauty of our conversation is in actual conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wylisa, for that inspirational presentation. So we will be moving on to questions and answers. And one of the first questions is, mm -hmm. what is the best resource for people who want to dive in deeper to really understand what's happening currently? And are there specific books or podcasts that you really listen to? Oh gosh. Well, I'm awfully, always on Twitter. Um, I love LinkedIn and the articles that are there. I show up to a lot of different webinars. That's one of the beauties about uh, Hannah. There are a lot of free things right now. So, there are a lot of university resources I might not normally be able to get access to, but I show up and I read those. I am a member of my own professional society association, um, ASAE, the American Society of Association Executives. So I read everything that they put out. Now, I don't always read it when they send it to me. So let's just be honest about that. I typically throw things into a file and I try to keep Fridays as my reading days. And I ask a lot of people about what they're reading. So leadership is a hot topic for me. So anything around authentic leadership, anything that talks about new ways of 
navigating as a leader, those are things that are going to be at the top of my list right now. Next right. question. Yeah, the next question we have for you is where do you see Ahima going in the next 10 years? Ahima's future is so bright. And one of the reasons Ahima's future is so bright is because of all of you. There are opportunities that you will have available for you that maybe those who were earlier in their careers didn't have. So you now have not only the traditional hospital routes available to you, but you have vendor routes. You have educational routes. You have, I was on a presentation uh, yesterday that was talking about the work that Walgreens and um, Walmart are doing with the, their work to really take their, to step into primary care. I was on a presentation last week talking about the future of healthcare delivery. And that one of the things that will probably come out of the COVID pandemic is that we're gonna see more and more the return of care to the home and including people wanting to die within your home. So if we think about the notion that data is everywhere, what we have before us then as an organization is that we need to be showing up everywhere that data is showing up. That is why I was on a call early, earlier today participating in a meeting that's taking, that took place in Berlin, is our future is directly tied to healthcare data and healthcare information. And this pandemic has shown us that we have this link between what we do and what public health does. So I honestly believe there is no limit to our future. We can go in multiple different directions, ensuring excellence in a support of providers and patients. The question for us is, are we willing to lean into that future that is so broad and uh, for us? So one of the things that we'll be looking at is what, what can we do more from a, a business to business perspective? AHIMA has traditionally been what's known as a B2C organization, business to consumer. But are there things that we should be looking at from a B2B perspective? How do we better engage with the Walmarts of the world and the Walgreens of the world, those who are looking at alternative approaches to healthcare while still working to deepen our, our opportunities and our relationships and our partners with the traditional routes of healthcare as well. Um, thank you. Uh, we also have another question in the chat. It's what is the best way to network and meet new people in the field? Great. So you can uh, show up and participate in conferences. That's one way. Another way is to uh, leverage your social media platforms as a way of engaging with people. Get involved with the state associations. That is a, a, a wonderful way to engage with a smaller group. There is a student academy that takes place with our annual conference. That is another way that you can engage and get involved in. So there are multiple ways that you can do so. Maybe you may want to uh, eventually write something and submit it for publication through uh, one of the two venues that are available. We will be launching a new community that you'll hear more about in 2021 that's gonna provide a new uh, pathway for engagement as well. We have another question in the chat from Alex, who is asking, machine learning and data mining have led to increasing integration of AI into the healthcare decision-making process. Due to the data sets used to train these tools, there has been much debate about the bias introduced by their use. Where and how do you see AHIMA applying their, an their ethical standards and standing to address these types of disparities? That's a great question, Alex. We had an opportunity to have a bioethicist speak to a small group of us. And uh, the, the questions that you are raising are some of the questions that he raised as well. So when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's still gonna need to be a human agent that is supporting that work. And that is why it's really important that we uh, expand our foray into data analytics as a profession, because that's where we get an opportunity to influence some of that bias. One of the conversations that I've had with an AI vendor is around the algorithms. And 
one of the things he shared with me is that we can't find enough qualified uh, individuals with advanced skill sets within the profession to help impact our algorithms. That's going to be another way in which we can do that. So it, it goes back to the earlier conversation about the future of the profession and the future of AHIMA is be, we can look at these traditional and non-traditional ways for how we influence the work that is occurring around these emerging areas. And you will begin to see AHIMA talk more about artificial intelligence and machine learnings and look at for how do we begin to impact some of that work. It was very intentional at AHIMA 20 this year that we offered more topics around artificial learning. You will also begin to see us doing more emerging topics and cutting edge topics. And we're doing that a very intentional because we need for the profession to be knowledgeable on those topics in order to have an impact within those care settings. Hi, um, Maria wants to know what was an experience that you felt really impacted your journey in becoming the leader you are today and helped you gain the confidence you have? Oh my gosh. What was an experience? Failing. And that may sound strange that I would say failing. Sometimes the best lessons we learn are lessons that are learned in the valley instead of on the mountaintop. And so learning that I was a resilient individual has served me well. There was, I won't go into details, but there was a specific, specific issue that occurred when I was chief operating officer at the American Nurses Association. And it was a defining moment for me. I either was going to rise above that set of circumstances, or I was going to allow that set of circumstances to defeat me. And I chose to rise above that set of circumstances. So that set of circumstances taught me that I was a resilient individual it taught me that I could accept accountability when accountability needed to be accepted. None of us are perfect and we're all gonna make mistakes. And so what I want to create at AHIMA is a learning culture because as we're on the pathway to becoming a growth oriented and innovative culture, we have to be comfortable making mistakes. We have to be comfortable failing because that's how we're gonna really lean into our potential through experimentation and failing. I just try not to make the same mistake twice. So another question from the Q&A, uh, Abdullah said that Ahima has an office in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. So with the expansion of Ahima and health information management as a whole, um, could you talk more about how Ahima is going to expand into surrounding countries like Saudi Arabia? So I'm, um, I'm gonna just correct a little bit. We have a presence in UAE. We don't have an official office yet. Uh, that is something that we are working on. So we are, I never thought we would be in Saudi Arabia. So no to self, never say what you're not gonna do and never be surprised by the opportunities that came your way. We have been doing quite a bit of work in Saudi Arabia this year. As a result of the work we did last year when I traveled to the Middle East and met with some of the leaders of HIM in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is on the Australian skill set, uh, uh, not skill set, the uh, excuse me, Australian code set. But that was insufficient for the work that they wanted to do. And so we were actually brought to the table to work with the Australian uh, HIM Association to help them develop a modified code set that they are rolling out next month. And as a result of that, we also won the contract to help develop their training materials. And we are working to launch the conference next month, Operation Health, that will begin to train the number of coders that they need to bring to the table, as well as the C-suite leaders within their hospitals for how to implement this new modified billing system. And so we are beginning to develop some deep tentacles in Saudi Arabia. We've always had a strong partnership in Abu Dhabi and the Dubai area, and we will continue to support our work internationally. And we're able to do that 
in a way that still uplifts and support the work that we do domestically. They're not, it's not an or situation. We are able to do both because again, wherever health information is, we need to show up. I'm not ready to really share where we might go beyond the, the Middle East, which is where our primary focus is. But again, you heard me talk about uh, greeting people in Berlin. That's not happenstance. We are trying to increase visibility for the profession and AHIMA in Europe. And we will see what doors open there and what doors we may be doing, what, what things we might be doing next in Europe as well. Speaking a little more on the technical skills, do you think that AHIMA will have changes to a program accreditation that includes more technical skills? So I'm really not in the position to really talk about what will happen from an accreditation perspective. That is work that will be done by the various commissions that we have. What I can say is that we all understand our world is changing very, very quickly and that we have a responsibility to ensure that our professionals have the skills to successfully navigate in the environments they will find themselves operating in. The next question we have from the chat is, what can HIM students and educators bring to nonprofits at this critical time? Gosh, you can bring so much. You can bring your energy. You can bring your creativity. You can bring your questions. I mean, you look at the world through a different set of lens than what we look through. And we need you. We need you to bring your your different perspectives to the table. We need you to bring your skill sets. I mean, we have much to offer you and we have much to learn from you. We need you to be involved, not only with AHIMA, but with nonprofits in your local community. One of the things that I offer to you for consideration, especially for those of you who aspire to be leaders, is that one of the best ways for you to develop your leadership skills is by getting involved with nonprofit organizations. That's what I did. When I lived in Dallas, I actually volunteered for the Dallas Holocaust Center. That is how I began to sharpen my leadership skills. And it's also a way of enhancing your resume. Sometimes we can't build all of the skills that we desire to build within our place of employment. By aligning us and, and, and engaging with nonprofit organizations, it gives you a way to also develop additional skills for your resume. So we need you. Please come join us. We want you. Um, so the next question is, how have you built resiliency skills and maintained a sense of empowerment in the workplace, even when faced with difficult interpersonal dynamics? Wow, that's another great question. It's not easy. Uh, for me, I hold firm to my faith. That's a, a critical part of who I am. But I think another part of resiliency is learning to be vulnerable. And that's not always easy. Whether it's because, you know, different portions of our population, those who may be women, those who may be people of color, you know, we often feel that we can't be vulnerable in the workplace. But one of the lessons that I learned is that to really grow as a leader, you also have to become vulnerable. And that means that when you make mistakes, you own it and you accept responsibility for it. And what you learn is that most people respect a leader who does that. I mean, navigating through COVID has not been easy. We had a game plan and it was a solid game plan and it was working. We had a wonderful uh, first quarter, but then all of our plans, both domestic and international, we had to reset and step back and say, how can we still be successful this year? And I will admit that that was a low point for me as a leader. Doing organizational transformation work or reinvention work isn't easy. It takes a lot out of you. And you have to be a, a strong individual to do this work. And so the notion, this not that we were planning to coast this year, but we were planning to celebrate some this year. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And then it's like, oh my gosh, do I have it in me to dig down and navigate this organization through something that we don't even understand? There's not a playbook for how to navigate through a global health crisis this way. And so part of what you do is you get yourself out of the way because you can't focus on, I can't, I can't, I can't. 
And so again, that's why I started building communities. I started reaching out to other leaders. Tell me what you're thinking. I spent a lot of time on the phone with uh, leaders across a broad sector of organizations trying to understand what they are doing. I I talk to the board of directors about what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing. I talk to my staff about what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing. You know, I am who I am. And so how I am with you today is how I am with the board of directors, which Val can attest to. It's how I am with my staff. And so you've got to be rock solid on knowing who you are as an individual and who you are as a leader and you hold on to your personal North Stars. And that's how you navigate the type of environment that we're in right now. And you pivot quickly. When you see that something isn't working or it's not working the way you need to, you need it or you thought it would work, don't be afraid to pivot to something else. Oftentimes we stay on a pathway too long and we know something's not gonna end in the positive results that we want it to, but we let pride, we let ever fill in the blank for whatever words you want to fill in, we don't pivot fast enough to, the, to, to a new reality. Speed is important in the world that we, lead, we uh, live in right now. And as we develop the muscles of speed, we also have to acknowledge their unintended consequences. But sometimes when you're moving fast to take advantage of opportunities, and sometimes when you're moving fast to um, avoid the boulder that's in front of you, you aren't communicating as effectively if you, as you need to communicate. You aren't bringing all the people into the loop that you need to bring into the loop. So it's owning that and saying, okay, I didn't get it right this time. Let me look at the lessons I can learn from this so that I will do better the next time. Our next question is from Denise. Um, what is an aspect of a HEMA that you would like to change and how have you been working towards it? Whoa, okay, what? You know, I, I, I guess the one thing I will say to you is I sometimes fear we don't fully appreciate the potential we have at AHIMA and we get stuck. And if I could change anything, it would be for us to lean 100% into our full potential and not get stuck on things that maybe made sense a decade ago but they don't make as much sense now in the environment that we're trying to navigate. Next question we have is from Nathan in the chat. He says, there will be an, there will be an official new presidential administration staff and potential changes to policies. Some changes might be earth shattering in the future. Do you foresee any big changes impacting AHIMA in the near future? At this point, I'm gonna say no. And the reason I'm saying no is because the core issues that we are working on are still important regardless of who is in the White House. The work that we're doing around our patient ID now coalition addressing issues of patient misidentification are still important. The issues that we're doing around social determinants of health and how do we factor that in to ensure that people have a true complete health record, that's still important. The work that we will do around privacy is still important. So our core issues don't change just because of who's in the White House. Our next question is from Quinn. Um, what skills would you recommend picking up or practicing to prepare us for working in a virtual environment while we're still in quarantine right now? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I think we're still all learning how to do that. So one of the things I learned from a webinar that I was on is you still got to show your hands. Now I'm showing them fast because I don't have a really great manicure right now, but there's something about what this speaker said is that you're showing your hands is a way of conveying trust. And so I just share that tidbit with you. You still have to know how to engage people. So that is another lesson that we have to learn how we engage people in a virtual environment isn't the same way that we engage people when we're face to face. I've had to get real creative on how to still interact and engage with my staff. So one of the things that we've done is we do check in Thursday. Sometimes it's just a, a, a question I may ask them to respond to. Today, it wasn't even a question. It was just a reminder to them to take a break 
I, I know you guys are working more hours than you ever thought you would be working from a remote situation. Just step away. It's okay to take a break. And so the interpersonal components of what we do is still important. You know, there is value in being able to look someone in the eye. And we can't do that the same way we could do in a face-to-face -face environment. So we probably have to clarify and confirm more in our virtual environment because we can't see all the body language. We have to not be so quick to jump to assumptions because again, we can't see the person we're interacting with. And so I think for all of us learning to tamp down our emotions because we are emotional people, but let's tamp down our emotions and maybe let's clarify and confirm and try to understand motive more is, uh, I think those are all very useful skills in a virtual environment. Our next question is, how do you lead with authority and empathy while remaining neutral, professional, and not crossing boundaries? Whew. Well, some days I do it better than other days. Um, again, stay grounded. Know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Always be willing to give a person uh, the doubt, I mean, the, the benefit of the doubt. So always assume good intent is how you do it. You know, it's not always possible to remain neutral as a leader. There are times in which you have to make a decision and the decision that you make isn't going to be one that everyone uh, cares for. That just goes with the territory of being a leader. And that's why I always come back to being grounded in your values and knowing who you are. Make the best possible decisions that you can make with the data that you have available to you. And you can't always wait to have 100% of the data. Colin Powell said, if you've got 70% move, I think in the environment we're in right now, if you've got 50% move and you have to figure out the rest of the journey, be willing to be vulnerable, as I said earlier, and depending on the decision, be willing to be flexible and be willing to compromise. But there are going to be those circumstances. And I try to, for me personally, I try to have those be as few as possible where you have to stand your ground and you have to say, this is the decision based on everything that I know that is in the best interest of the organization. So Michael asks, do you think this pandemic will impact how we see healthcare in the future since some visits are through telehealth? Or do you, do you see telehealth being the main source of healthcare in the near future? Another great question. I do think this pandemic is going to impact how we see health. And again, I go back to a conversation that we had with the chief strategy officer from Harold Ford Hospital and some of the things that she shared in her conversation with us. I think that telehealth is here for us, it's gonna be here with us for a while. It may look differently than how it looks now. You know, I think about my telehealth visits with my provider. My first telehealth visit didn't look like my third telehealth visit. That just between the first and the third visit, there had been enhancements that have been made there. That if we are truly going to see healthcare moving more back to the home environment, and that there's a desire of people to be able to die within their homes, that's going to have implications for us. As much as we might like to go back to our world before the pandemic hit, I don't think that that's gonna be possible for us. I think what we have to do is learn what has worked well during this pandemic that we want to make sure, make sure that we continue to insinuate and what hasn't worked well that we need to go back and, and take a step back and look at lessons learned. Healthcare delivery is going to be different work in the future, whether it's within healthcare or not within healthcare is going to be different. I mean, right now we're contemplating what does work look, for, look like for us when we can eventually go back to our offices. The social contract that I had with my staff before we went remote more than likely isn't gonna be the same social contract I have with them when we eventually reopen our office. Our world has fundamentally changed. And change is not always a bad thing. 
we are coming upon 5 p.m. So we just want to thank you for your time and thank you for everyone who came out today to hear our wonderful guest speaker. Um, thank you for all the questions. We got so many and we wish we could answer them all truly, but thank you for your participation and coming out. And our next one will be after break. So just tune in and thank you, Dr. Harris, for coming and speaking to us. And if you have any last words, you can say them now. Thank you. I am honored that you chose me to be your second guest. And what my final parting words would be to you, you are our future. Lean into your potential. Do not see barriers, see only possibilities because we're depending on you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>